hello everyone. Um, yeah, so this work is a, a collaboration with my postdoc at Brock University, and it's about Bayesian networks. So I, I'm, uh, I was not sure if everyone knows what Bayesian networks are. So um, I thought of giving an introduction to Bayesian networks to start with when I teach Bayesian networks in my graduate course, it takes me at least 10 lectures to, to, to say properly what Bayesian networks are and how we can learn them from data. I'm gonna try to do that in 10 minutes here, so let's see if I can handle that. Uh, um, imagine that you, back to COVID, um, I, I suppose we all know well how it goes. Well, imagine that you're asked to determine the likelihood that a person not wearing a mask but keeping the social distance will be infected with COVID. Okay, so probability 101, we can just write it down as a probability, like a simple probability P of COVID given mask, given social distancing. Mask is false, okay. Now we wanna answer this probabilistic inquiry by data, okay? Like imagine you've collected 12 samples, 12 individuals, you ask each of them one by one, did you have COVID, did you wear masks, did you do social, did you keep so social distancing, yes or no? And then you have this full data. In this case, we just have 12. And then by definition, we just write down the probability using conditional probability, we just count, right? Simply we count how many cases we have, uh, like true, false, true, how many cases we have false, true, and then we get the final answer, right? This is basic probability. Now, these kind of, um, kind of like probability inquiries, it happens everywhere, right? Like imagine it's the question is something like, okay, the probability of this person with this genotypes, right, this gene history, uh, will develop cancer, for example. So always we will have a probabilistic query, and then the way we answer it is basically by using joint distributions. So the key appears to be joint distributions. If we have joint distributions, then we can answer anything. So this is overly simplistic, but then imagine now a little bit more closer to the realities that, well, not you don't have just three variables. You have like 12 of them, for example, in this case. You measure different things, flu, cough, fever, ventilation, and so on. Most of them are, are binary in this case, but then season in this case is like four. Uh, it takes four values, okay? Now, imagine you want to get the joint probability distribution for all of these variables, and you have surveyed 1,000 individuals. Okay, how can we do that? Well, the number of parameters, just to start with, is around 8,000, okay? That's already more than your sample size. So there's already some problem here to model this joint probability distribution if you don't make any assumption, right? So what are you gonna do with the like, remaining 7,000? You cannot simply let them equal to zero. So then what's the solution? Well, one idea that can help to simplify this joint probability distribution, which appears to be the key for answering any probability query, is, well, we can use conditional independencies. I suppose you all know what conditional independence is. Uh, we say X and Y are independent if the probability of the joint is the multiplication of the two. You can have the same thing when it's conditional independence. I won't go, um, again, I suppose you all are well familiar with this. But what's the point of this? Well, what it can do is that it can reduce the number of parameters required to represent a joint probability distribution. How? We can use a chain rule. We can factorize any probability distribution into these terms, and then we can simplify them. How? Well, let's see it in practice. Imagine that we have four variables, x1 to x4, and using the chain rule with this particular order, I've just written it down and uh, did the decomposition. And then imagine that we know additionally that two variables, x4 and x3, are, uh, sorry, x4 and x1 and x2 are independent condition on x3. So we have this relationship. And that means that already the number of parameters for this conditional probability distribution reduces from eight to two by just this. Hmm? Now if I put it back in the original joint distribution, I will have this, okay? So this means that my original distribution goes down from 15 parameters to nine. If I have this joint, if this conditional independence. So 
Now, this is perhaps quite simplistic, but it will be challenging with work, when working with many variables because, first of all, you need to know in what order you need to uh, use the chain, or, uh, chain rule, and secondly, you may have many, many of these conditional independencies. Which ones to use and when? So the idea is that, well, a graphical visualization can help. Um, this is the, the same joint probability as the last slide, and the idea of Bayesianness is basically this. You can visualize the decomposition by a graph. How? Well, the idea is basically that for each variable that appears in this decomposition, you look at the right-hand side of the conditioning, like here I have x3, x2, x1. So each of them will be the parent of the ones on the left-hand side, okay? So like here I have x4, I'm just writing it down here, and then who is it on the right-hand side is x3, I make a link from x3 to x4. And then I have like x3 here, the parents are x2 and x1, I link them here, and so on. By doing this, I will have a directed acyclic graph. You can easily check that it will be acyclic, like you, you cannot have a directed cycle. This is a cycle, but it's not directed. Now, uh, these together, the graph and the probability distributions, they form the so-called Bayesian network. So the thing is that I have the conditional probability distributions. You can write it, them down in using whatever probability distribution that you're interested in and the DAG. And then once I have these, I can immediately get the joint probability distribution as well. It's the multiplication of these factors, that simple. Now, perhaps coincidentally, this is a DAG, right? And we, uh, for causal networks, we also work with DAGs. So under some nice, some, uh, some well, uh, let's say some, some uh, perhaps good assumptions, we can show that up to some extent at least, this graph also is a causal graph. Hmm? But I'm not gonna get into that. Uh, th that's why Bayesian networks have gained more attraction these uh, recent years. But at the end of the day, I have a Bayesian network, and if I have it, then I have the joint probability distribution. Back to our original example, I have 12, 12 variables. If I can somehow decompose the joint probability distribution, say in this way, then I can have the graph, and then I can work with this graph, I can work with joint probability distributions, right? I can then answer any probabilistic query. The main question, though, is that how can I get this graph, right? So. Well, the idea is that we have several algorithms to do that. I want to focus on perhaps the well-established, the most well-established and well-known algorithm, the PC algorithm. The idea is that um, in that graph, which I just represented here, okay, you, you see that several nodes, several variables, there's no link between them, right? And the idea is that that will happen only if one variable becomes independent of the other given its parents. Okay, like in this particular case, x and y gets independent given the parents z3, z4, and z5. So always, if two variables, there's no link between them, you should find the, per, uh, the set of parents that will make them disjoint. And there's a dilemma for that, like no link between x and y, then either condition on the parents of x or condition on the parents of y, they will become independent. So this already gives me an idea to check how the independence works. Because I can just check two nodes, whether they are conditionally independent or not. If not, then I will erase the link between them. So let's uh, focus back on our COVID problem. So I start with a fully connected network. Imagine I want to find the joint probability distribution for these variables. Finding the joint probability distribution is equivalent to finding the Bayesian network for them. How do I do that? This algorithm says uh, that you start with a fully connected network and then you check step by step whether two variables are independent or not. So step one, we just construct the full, al uh, full network and then apparently in this case, for example, I check and then I see using any statistical tool like chi-squared, anything else, I check whether and I see M and D are independent, mask and social distancing. The moment I see that, I will raise the link between them. And then I continue. Uh, F 
And these variables may not be independent themselves, but they may be independent conditioned on some other variable. The moment this happens, it will erase those links as well, okay, all of them. Like in this case, fever and all the other ones will be erased. And so on, I check the other independencies, I continue, continue, until all of them get erased. At some point, there's no further reduction you can do. This is your network, okay? And then there are some further steps that help you to get the directions of these arrows, which I, won't, uh, I don't have the time to cover that. I'm more interested in this skeleton. The moment you have this, you can, uh, and then if you have also the directions, you can write the joint probability distribution. Okay, so this was <coughs> the PC, sorry. And then we have, what we wanna do is that, well, we thought this algorithm can be improved. And this is where what, what we call the shortcut PC. What is the idea now? So imagine that we have these nodes X5 and X8. This is a like, quite dense, uh, fairly dense uh, graph here. And then we wanna identify this structure, okay? What PC does is it says, well, tell me the parents. Who are the parents of X5? Who are the, or who are the parents of X8? One of them, if I condition on, it's, it, it will work. It will do the job. The only issue is that when you do the algorithm, as we just saw, there's no direction. So potentially for X5, all of these nodes will be a potential parent. So it has to search two to the power of like all possible subsets of all these nodes, right? And that's, that immediately results in some, uh, slowing down and, um, the algorithm. Well, what, what we tried to do was that, okay, let's have a closer look at this. First of all, those nodes that are not connected to X8, they cannot form as a parent. They, don't, they, they won't drive these two conditional independent. So let's just throw them away in doing the uh, conditional test. This apparently simple idea can like hugely reduce the, uh, the number of computations necessary to get the graph. So that's with the purple. And then secondly, we thought that for these other nodes, some of them, you see like this is a completely separate trail or path that do not interact with the other nodes. Well, you can just block this uh, trail. If you just observe two consecutive nodes on this, you can block and then there will be no flow of information, so you don't need to worry about these yellow lines or, or yellow path. So then you can only focus on these blue ones. And there's a theory to support this. It's basically that if you have a DAG and you have a trail between nodes X and Y of size at least three, then two adjacent interior nodes of the trail are observed, meaning like X16, X15, then the trail is inactive, meaning that the two will become independent, no matter what other nodes on that trail are observed. So by following this, instead of doing that whole graph, all those blue nodes, we only now can focus on the, these blue nodes here. So basically in this graph, like instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, sorry, nine, I think, like we could only focus on these fives. Like, and, and this exponentially, right? Because it's two to the power of five possible subsets. Okay, so we tried this and here is the comparison between the PC and what we have, the shortcut PC, and this is an optimized version where we make some improvements in the implementation. And this is just the number of conditional independence tests. Like you see, we can prove actually you will always have fewer conditional independence tests using this uh, shortcut PC. Uh, the only, the cost though is that, well, you will have more variables on the conditioning term. And in terms of runtime, the results are so far a bit mixed, we're still working on it. But then if you do uh, like a non-parametric, for example, a pair T test or, or so, you will see that indeed shortcut PC or the optimized version, there is a significant dif difference and you, you see the mean here is lower because like these ones, they didn't finish in, in, uh, in seven, uh, in, in a week, so we stopped there. So uh, to conclude, uh, this whole shortcut PC algorithm, the idea was to limit the search space for all the possible conditional independence tests for the parents that the variable is looking for. The number of CI tests can be proven 
to be always less using shortcut PC, and in examples it can be of orders of magnitude less. Uh, the, the cost is that the conditioning term, like um, uh, it, can, it can grow, and that can also exponentially increase the running time. So tests, conditional tests that do not grow exponentially, the runtime, on the conditional part, using them, developing them, and working on them, that's future work and can be used here. Yeah, that's the final point. Thank you, any questions? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm from York University, and uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, differentially private projection depth-based medians. So all it is is a multivariate median that protects the privacy of individuals that would be in the data set. And this is joint work with my uh, good friend, Dylan Spicker, at UNB. And uh, actually, he was supervised by Michael. So yeah. OK. So. Uh, most of my talk, yeah, is going to be going over what this median is and what privacy is since we only get 15 minutes. But uh, hopefully, um, if you take anything away from my talk, it's just a little bit about what uh, differential privacy is. And so, okay, so it's a powerful framework for uh, maintaining the privacy of individuals in a data set. So I think it came around around 20 years ago, and it's been adopted by a lot of very like large institutions, such as the US Census Bureau. And basically, uh, within this framework, any statistic that you release uh, or any, data, any like portion of data from your data set that you release publicly has to be differentially private. So it has to satisfy this mathematical uh, property, differential privacy. And then, um, if it satisfies this property, sorry, my mouth is really dry. Um, if it satisfies differential privacy, then we say that an adversary can't use this to learn about to learn anything about the individual's uh, data that's in the data set. And uh, how we make a statistic differentially private is through adding uh, noise to it, so making the uh, the non-private statistic noisy, and we add calibrated noise in a sophisticated manner. So it's not necessarily just adding. Um, Gaussian noise, but we, we might add the noise in, in a different way. But um, we always have that conditional on the data. A differentially private statistic is random, which, which differs like uh, substantially from traditional statistics where it's just a t deterministic function uh, of your data. So um, yeah, differential privacy, it's a property of a statistic. And it requires that the statistic is drawn from a non-degenerate measure, which depends on the data. So just to really hammer this home, you get your data. Then you construct a measure or probability distribution that's a function of that data. And then your statistic, in this case the median, is going to be one draw from that measure. Okay. And so um, we just need one concept uh, to introduce or define differential privacy, and that is of adjacent databases. So all it is is we say two databases with endpoints xn and yn are adjacent if they differ in exactly one observation. So you, if you have a data set xn, uh, and then you just take one row, if you think of it as rows and columns, and replace it with a different row, then you would have an adjacent uh, database. And then, OK, so, so here's the definition of differential privacy. Uh, I don't think it's super intuitive, but I'll try to give you um, the quickest uh, intuition I can. But basically, we say that um, the statistic drawn from this measure, or you could also say this measure or mechanism, is epsilon delta differentially private. So epsilon and delta are the kind of level of how private uh, your statistic is. If uh, for any event and any pair of adjacent databases, we have that this inequality holds. And basically what this inequality is saying, if I add these little caveats here, is that if I change one observation, my conditional measure Q uh, doesn't change too much. So uh, for adjacent databases, the, the conditional measures are close. And then what the uh, parameters are, our um, epsilon is kind of like the main privacy parameter, 
and it's going to be close to 0 and fixed in n, so that this term is close to 1. And then delta is should be really small, and it's kind of interpreted as your probability that you accidentally leak something from the data set. So, so this one is going to be understandably uh, very small, like maybe 1 over n to some large uh, constant L. Okay, So that's uh, differential privacy. And OK, so, so now I'm going to go back to the problem at hand. Basically, if um, we say this framework is very good, but if we want people to use it, then we need to make uh, private usable versions of common estimators people might use. For example, one could be um, a median. And some of you might think um, in the multivariate setting about the coordinate-wise median, but um, robust statistics, I guess, has demonstrated that the coordinate-wise median doesn't perform very well um, for multivariate data. Like sometimes, yeah, sometimes the coordinate-wise median can be outside the convex hall of the data, which is obviously not, um, not desirable. So typically, um, we use a different median, and then there's a bunch of these multivariate medians because none of them all have gold standard, all the properties that we would want in a median. So there's a bunch of them, and then the one that we focused on was the projection depth-based median. OK, yeah, so, so just, to, just so, to be clear, so there's some private versions of other multivariate medians, um, but either those works required moment bounds, which we generally don't want uh, for a median, because traditionally uh, you kind of want to study the behavior of the median when the distribution has no moments. For example, in 1D, the median um, still exists, for example, for the Cauchy distribution, which has no mean. Yeah, that's what I said. So why study these medians? What's nice about these ones is that they have this kind of trio of properties where they're affine and covariant, which means the um, measurement system used for the data doesn't uh, affect the, the outcome. And then also, they're highly efficient uh, relative to some of the other medians and also have kind of the highest uh, breakdown, uh, at least to my knowledge, which is a uh, breakdown is a robustness uh, property. So yeah, the goal of this work is to develop and study private projection depth-based medians. And so uh, what is this median? So I'll try to give you a quick overview of this median, which is also complicated. But if you think of trying to measure how outlying a point x would be in the univariate setting, you might um, have seen a metric like this, where you subtract the mean or the median and divide by either the standard deviation or the median absolute deviation and take the absolute value. Is kind of like a z-score or a robustified z-score is how you would kind of measure how outlying x would be in this sample. Okay. So what we want to do is kind of extend this to the multivariate setting. So how we're we going to measure the outlyingness of a point in the multivariate setting, and we're going to use uh, this idea. So we'll just look at an example uh, in the bivariate setting to, to demonstrate how it works. So we have this data set of points y and then this point x that we want to find the outlyingness of. And what you can do is look in a particular direction or at a particular unit vector u and then project everything onto u like this and then also project x onto u. And what we can do now is this, well, if we look along this line, if we just kind of crouch over here and look like this, it kind of looks like a univariate sample. And then um, from there, we can just use uh, our standard outlyingness metric, um, which we already are familiar with and comfortable with and know works well. And then if we want to kind of, uh, so this is only for direction u, so we obviously want something for the whole space. So what you can do is look at all directions u and say the outlyingness is kind of the most offensive direction or the direction where that point has the largest uh, outlyingness. So we kind of think that we, the idea is that if there's at least one direction that the point's outlying in, then it has a high outlyingness score. OK, so this is, just, this is just the measure of outlyingness. So then what about the median? And then the median is just the least outlying point. It's just the minimizer of, 
uh, this outlying this function. So that, that's the projection depth-based median. It's actually a whole class of medians because you can put any univariate mu and sigma in there uh, that you want. So th this is the definition, but the only part um, that's kind of important is that the, the median that we're interested in is just the minimizer of this outlying this function. Okay, so then, now I have all the background. How are we gonna make this median private? And what we use is um, kind of a common or stable algorithm in differential privacy known as proposed test release. And so how it works at a high level, a very high level, is that you propose a non-private statistic. For example, in this case, it would be the non-private projection depth-based median. And then what you do is you test if the proposed statistic is locally sensitive. So you test what happens to the statistic in your specific data set if you change a few observations. You see how much it moves around. And if it doesn't move around too much, then we release a noisy version of that statistic. Otherwise, uh, we don't release anything, but we lose some privacy budget. So it, it's not good if we don't release anything. It's not like nothing happens. It's, it's kind of worse, it's kind of bad. We really don't want to do that. Okay, so, and then the noisy version of the statistic is just um, you make a density basically, and it, you concentrate it around the non-private median, and then you take a draw from that. That's, that's what this is, it's called the exponential mechanism. But I'm sorry, I have too many concepts, I don't have time for this. So if you're interested in this, happy to talk about it later. But basically, yeah, you just, you just place something around the, the, the non-private median, and then you draw from that density. Okay, so. And then the test, uh, I'm not gonna go through the test either because it's just too complicated, but basically you just see how many points it takes to change uh, the median by, or the outlying this function by a lot, and if it's not, if it's a lot of points, then we pass the test. But um, yeah, don't worry, don't worry too much about the test because I want to get to our actual result. How much time do I have? Three minutes, yeah, okay. So, yeah, this is our algorithm. So basically what you do is you compute this noisy safety margin and, or this indicator function, and if it's equal to one, then we release a draw from that density I just told you about. And otherwise, we don't release anything, but we lose epsilon delta of our privacy budget. Super sad. So obviously, naturally, um, what we're interested in is the failure probability. So what's the probability we don't lose anything? Uh, we're also interested in what is the cost of privacy? So how much worse um, does this uh, estimator do compared to the non-private estimator? And then is this estimator still robust? So does it still have high breakdown, those, uh, uh, the, those, or those other uh, properties that I was talking about earlier? So those are our three main results, are kind of answering these three questions. And uh, there's, so, yeah, so basically our three results are three uh, theorems that give conditions on mu and sigma under which uh, we can answer these questions, I guess. So the first one is that with high probability, uh, changing a few observations, namely three, does not move mu and sigma around too much over all directions. And then the second one is that over all directions, mu and sigma are concentrating around their uh, non-population uh, counterparts. This one's pretty standard. And then the last one is just that the, the parameters are bounded. So don't, don't worry about that one too much, but uh, so I'll just go through our main results really quickly. But basically the first one is that under those conditions, the probability that we fail the test is essentially um, when you work everything out, dominated by delta. So the probability we fail the test is similar to the probability that we accidentally leak some information, which is obviously going to be controlled and very small, so we feel that this is acceptable. And then our second main result is just uh, finite sample deviations bound. So under those conditions uh, with probability one minus gamma, this is the um, distance between the private estimator and the population counterpart. 
and there's two terms here, and then this one is kind of the non-private sampling error, and this one is the cost of privacy. So if you wanted to see like um, what the cost of privacy is, you would compare this rate of convergence to this one, and then when you actually plug in mu and sigma, you'll see that this is much faster than this, so the, the sampling error is, is always dominating the uh, privacy error. So in other words, for large n, you kind of get privacy for free. For free, that's what people say, but it's obviously not for free. So, okay, and then the last thing is that basically, um, for the breakdown point, uh, I'll just remind people with the breakdown point if they don't know what this is. It's the maximum fraction of points which can be set to arbitrary values in your data set, uh, under which your estimator remains finite and bounded uh, away from the boundary of the parameter space. So it's basically just how many points can you change before your estimator just shoots off to infinity into space. And then uh, our result is just that the breakdown point of our estimator is at least as large as the minimum of the breakdown points of the, the input estimators, mu and sigma. Okay. And so, so we, yeah, we just submitted this paper, but uh, it's, it's on archive if, if you wanna check it out. And uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Slater. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Guelph. And today I'm going to be talking about a practical look at these particular types of models for modeling underreported uh, infectious disease surveillance data. So what is the purpose of collecting infectious disease surveillance data? Well, I would say that there's mainly two reasons. Firstly, uh, we want to get an estimate of the trends in the infectious disease. So whether or not that infectious, the, the cases of that infectious disease are sort of rising or falling, uh, et cetera. Uh, furthermore, we might want to know the prevalence of a particular infectious disease. Um, uh, that is, like, we want to know what fraction of the population either currently has or maybe has had in the recent past a particular infectious disease. Now, daily case count data, like the one that's displayed on your screen here, uh, is very abundant. It's probably the most abundant form of infectious disease surveillance data. But it's uh, subject to underreporting as well as something called underascertainment. But I'm just going to call everything underreporting just for the sake of simplicity. Okay? And so um, when we have underreported data, typically numbers like this look uh, are a, a somewhat poor reflection of the prevalence of the actual fraction of people with a disease. And they're also a so so reflection of the trend as well. And so um, what we want to know is that when we fit models to these data, we sort of know they aren't really telling the whole story. Um, but what necessarily are the consequences to fitting a, you know, a model to, um, to underreported data like this? And so looking at a, a really common class of models for this type of data, um, some, the, they're formally called Poisson autoregressions, but more colloquially in the, like infectious disease statistics literature, as endemic epidemic models. And they look a little something like this. So we have the case counts at YT, uh, given the case this time point, usually a week. Uh, we say that that is uh, Poisson distributed with some mean lambda t. And that mean lambda t is the sum of two components. Uh, one of those components, the most important one, is the epidemic component. And this is all of the cases that are explained in our data, or sorry, all the cases in our, at our current time point that are explained directly from cases at our previous time point. Okay? And so uh, if we have cases um, at a previous time point represented by these gray circles, uh, these blue circles would be the cases that are directly caused by those previous cases. Okay? And this alpha parameter here is uh, the expected number of offspring per gray circle. So for every gray circle, on average, how many blue circles kind of pop up? Right? And so this is, uh, depending on the context, will be interpreted as a reproduction number, sometimes a basic reproduction number, sometimes uh, an effective reproduction number. But it's a measure of the reproductive rate of a particular infectious disease. Okay? And the second component in this model is the endemic component, which is not the best name, but we'll roll with it. And this is the expected number of cases not explained by cases that are in our data set. Okay? And so the key thing that I think that a lot of statisticians get wrong who, who utilize these models is that old cases are the only cause of new cases. They can't pop up in any other way, at least in theory. 
right? And so we can think of this model as um, a mechanistic model in the sense that we sort of know what the cause is of our current cases, and we can sort of leverage that sort of quasi-causal information to, um, to estimate uh, things in the presence of underreporting. And there are actually some deep connections between this and classic compartment models um, as well, if you're, if you're curious. And so naturally, a lot of the problems that I end up working with are not just univariate problems. They are multivariate problems, maybe over some geographic regions or something. So we naturally extend this, uh, this framework to, the, to Poisson network autoregressions. And the key difference here, the key consideration, is that we now have to consider the propensity of people in other regions to infect people in other regions. So a person in region A can now infect somebody in, uh, in region B. And so what we need to do is come up with some way of building a network of infection, sort of spatio-temporally, um, to describe how the infectious disease sort of spreads over time. And so we usually do this through some sort of network data uh, that's input into these weights here, these Ws. So um, these Ws here are going to be built on um, some, usually some external data that reflects the contact rates between uh, people in regions I and J. So some really common examples in the literature would be something like uh, the physical distance between the two uh, sets of geographies. So imagine like the distance between postal code A and postal code B or something like that. Um, because you can imagine the, far, the further you are away from each other, the less likely you are to actually uh, come into contact and infect, uh, infect one another. Um, another way to uh, induce this sort of network data into the model would be through like commuting patterns and mobility or some more really complicated sort of state of the art uh, data. Uh, a couple of uh, differences as well is that these alpha i's are now local measures of infectiousness. They're this, basically interpreted as the same one in the past, but now they're sort of region specific. Um, but we can get an overall measure of infectiousness by building a matrix with these entries, alpha i times this weight. We build a matrix uh, with, these, with these entries. And if we take the largest eigenvalue of that matrix, we can get a measure of the reproductiveness of the whole system. Okay? So we can, we can measure reproduction uh, locally as well as kind of in aggregate. And so a couple of really interesting use ca uh, cases that have appeared in the literature. This one was based on some contact uh, or modeling uh, neurovirus, norovirus incidents in Berlin. And so what Meyer and Hell did in this case was they constructed those Ws that I was talking about, that, that uh, connectedness or that network, based on some social uh, contact survey data that was based on like individual level contacts between people of different age groups. So their strata was actually not geographies in this, in this particular example, but rather it was like the age groups. And so they built their Ws based on how basically how red or how yellow this, uh, this sort of contact matrix was. And the key thing that I want to highlight about this, I'm not going to show, go too deep into their paper, but rather I just want to say that their endemic component was, uh, appeared to be the key driver in um, producing sort of new cases. And so if you remember from my first slide, I'm immediately skeptical of this because remember that, e that epidemic component should really be the main driver of cases. Cases only come from previous cases. Um, and the motivation for the work that I'm, I'm going to present in a few slides here is actually work done by myself and colleagues, where what we did was we built those Ws based on time-varying um, mobility networks that were derived from cell phone data. And so we were working in Castilla, Leon, Spain and modeling the COVID-19 pandemic. What we had was uh, mobility data within and between each of the geographic regions of Castilla, Leon. And what we wanted to do was spatially, temporally relate that mobility network to this, the dominant eigenvalue of that matrix, or the reproductiveness of the system, and, and uh, to answer a couple of interesting epidemiological questions. So one of those questions was that we wanted to identify areas of high travel risk. So those are going to be areas in red in this, in this graph here. We also wanted to estimate the overall reproductiveness of the system, the, the uh, effective reproduction number of the whole system of Castilla-Leon. And furthermore, we wanted to attribute, um, we wanted to estimate the cases that were attributable to mobility. And so this is interesting to people who are uh, potentially interested in uh, giving a lockdown or something like that, or implementing some like uh, region-wide policy. And so we have to ask ourselves when we, when we fit this uh, big, complicated model that's too complicated to fit on a single slide, are all our results kind of 
nullified because we did all this stuff with underreported data. And, and the same with the, I have the same question with the last example. And so the big problem here, again, is that cases go undetected. So if you're using this as your outcome, you're inevitably gonna run into problems. But how does this affect our endemic component and our measure of infectiousness, our, our alpha? So imagine that we take that very first endemic epidemic component, or that, or sorry, endemic epidemic model that I showed you, that univariate model, and I simulated one realization from that model, okay? And then I choose to plot the, the current YT versus the YT one time unit ago. Okay, so this is time series data sort of plotted against itself, okay? And the slope of that line is gonna represent the infectiousness. The steeper the slope, the more infectious that infectious disease is, or the faster it, it reproduces. The intercept of that line is gonna be new, the endemic component. And as I report, so what happens is, as I report, so I go from a 100% reporting probability, I'm reporting every single case, as I decrease that reporting probability, what happens is I slowly attenuate the slope of that line and the, actually increase, uh, briefly, this, uh, the endemic component. So as I report fewer cases, my endemic component actually goes up, which is very, uh, somewhat counterintuitive. And so, yeah, so generally when we uh, fit models to underreported data, we overestimate this new, uh, relative at least to the, the epidemic component. We underestimate this alpha, and we also get the ratio of all of the moments sort of wrong as well. So if I fit a model um, to underreported data and I simulate from that model, the dispersion is gonna look different than it would had I not, had I fit it to uh, fully reported data. And this is one of the key characteristics for identifying um, underreported data. Uh, our solution, or a solution that has floated around a little bit in the recent literature is that um, we're going to model the underreporting mechanism via a hierarchical model. So what we're going to do is say now that the true case counts follow that endemic epidemic framework, but that we're only observing, our Ys, we're only observing some binomially thinned proportion of those cases. Uh, with some probability pi, or the reporting probability pi, and those, again, those Zs are the true case counts. You might, um, this model might look familiar to you. It might be called a hierarchical model, a state-space model, or an HMM, a hidden Markov model. But the key thing to know here is that as this model gets more and more complicated, as we extend uh, this model to, uh, uh, in various ways, the inference is very, very challenging. And the main reason is that you have a whole bunch of spatially, temporally correlated integer valued parameters, okay? So this causes a lot of problems for modern computation. And so you might be thinking, well, okay, if it's a hidden Markov model, why don't we just use methods of inference for the hidden Markov model? Well, if we add a, what we call a serial interval, so we basically extend the number of lags that we're sort of regressing on, all of a sudden our model's not Markov anymore, and we have to throw that method of inference out. There was a, another solution uh, proposed in 2021 where they consider this moment matching approach, a really cool idea, but they uh, assumed a negative binomial likelihood. And the problem in here is that this over dispersion parameter in the negative binomial clashes with that reporting probability. Because if you remember, the underreported data, dis dispersion is one of the ways that we can sort of identify underreported data. So this parameter sort of clashes with that reporting probability. And so it leads to, in their words, an unidentifiable model and thus they have to assume that their pi is known, which is a very strong assumption. Okay. And so uh, what I wanted was something a little bit more general. So I sort of Bayesian MCMC framework to, to work with this. So I tried writing some custom code uh, for months and I came up with this HMC update for all the continuous things and then doing this intelligent sort of block update plus uh, Hastings for all the integer value parameters. Okay. And I was able to get this to scale it up to about 100 point univariate time series, so like two weeks of weekly data, something like that, okay? Um, but it wasn't quite good enough for the problems that I'm interested in. And so my solution was to fit an equivalent model, or, or sorry, a model that's equivalent for large observed values of Y, or large observed values of K. And so I, uh, I found that if the Ys are 10 or greater, we can do normal approximations to both layers of that hierarchical model. And 
And this, what this does is it unlocks a couple of different methods of inference, primarily Hamiltonian Monte Carlo on all of the parameters, which is very, very good and much, much faster than what I was trying to do. Furthermore, I showed and I compared this proximate model to the, uh, to the exact, doing, exact Bayesian inference on the, on the true model and showed that when you fit this model, it's not only much, much faster, but you lose virtually nothing uh, in terms of the marginal posteriors of the parameters we're trying to estimate. Okay, so you get virtually the same thing if you use this approximate model versus that um, uh, the like exact underreported model. And so what I did was I took this um, the underreported or I built an underreported version of that uh, mobility network model that I showed you in, in Spain. And so and we actually assumed a completely unknown reporting probability, but we put a random walk model on it, basically saying it, it can vary over time, um, but smoothly over time. But we're estimating it completely just from epidemic data. And as a result, what we found was all quantities that were based on reproduction, so all the quantities that were based on those alpha-like things, uh, it actually increased uh, by a substantial amount. And for instance, travel risk increased by about 30% when we estimated it using this underreported model. Um, and thirdly, um, we found that, so if you look at the observed cases as these dots here, this is like the aggregate, right? So in, re in reality, this is a big multivariate model, but we've aggregated everything. And so um, if you look at the observed cases, there appears to be a really strong third wave here. But when we fit our underreported model to these data, our, uh, our model is somewhat skeptical of this third wave because it's inconsistent with, that, with infectious disease dynamics and it's more consistent with a rapidly changing reporting probability. Okay? And we observe this purely based on just looking at epidemic data. And so we further corroborated this finding with external data sources by looking at things like the rapid change in testing that occurred at this time. So this is obviously going to have a huge effect on the reporting probability. And uh, we also looked at things like the deaths data. We looked at the things like um, uh, percentage positivity and all these things sort of pointed to the fact that yes, that third wave is likely very exaggerated by changes in reporting probability and not necessarily changes in prevalence or, or incidence. So the key takeaways here and that I want to stress is that underreporting causes underestimation of infectiousness or the a reproduction rate of the disease and that if you are dealing with underreported data, um, consider modeling that underreported mechanism in the way that I've sort of presented here as that hierarchical model, okay? And I believe that puts me at time. Thank you so much. Happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Naomi. Yeah, so one thing I have to say before I start is I'm originally from the Caribbean, from Trinidad and Tobago. And I have to tell you this because people say they missed the first part of the, my talk guessing where I'm from. So I know from Trinidad and the Caribbean, so you have your full attention. And I'll need it because I compressed the 45 minute talk into 50 minutes, so. Please hang on. I put a lot of text on these slides, so some slides I'm just let you read them quickly. And for slides with a lot of results, I'll emphasize the key ones and let people who are interested read more. So I'm a professor in computer science as well as psychology and statistics. We have two PhD students in statistics. And so what I want to present on is intelligent adaptive experimentation. How do we integrate statistics and machine learning to accelerate science, but also help people? So let's start with a very practical problem. Think of this opportunity. Wouldn't it be great if every time a person touches technology, it was smart enough to get better for the next person? And think very concretely. Think of your website, where you've got some explanation of what you do. What if you had a system that would actually constantly add and test out different versions to explain it for different audiences to see if they'll click on your papers or if they'll engage more with you? So what my lab does is try and transform these touch points, like parts of a website or a text message, into intelligent adaptive interventions by using what we call the Adaptex software framework to enable perpetually adaptive experimentation. So what do these terms mean? So in terms of intelligent adaptive interventions, our Adaptex software framework, it won this prestigious X prize because Adaptex enables perpetual generation of versions. For example, if your website, you might have explanations A, B, C by crowdsourcing from human beings as well as large language models. And then Adaptex uses reinforcement learning algorithms to automatically do adaptive experiments, which test out and deploy what's working on average for who in what context, test it out, see what's working, and give things more or less often based on that. 
So what that means is that you can actually take a simple explanation and make an intelligent adaptive intervention because you enable perpetually adaptive experimentation. For example, explanations, you keep generating versions, test them out, and it kind of never stops improving. For example, the explanation of what you do. Does that make sense in terms of the vision? So that requires many disciplines like HCI, human can interaction, social behavioral sciences, and you can read more about those papers. But what I'm focusing on today is our research program in how can statistical sciences and machine learning support this kind of perpetually adaptive experimentation so we can keep improving technology touch points. This is just a nod to some of our multidisciplinary collaborators and the approach required. And the key thing is we build systems that you can get data sets and test algorithms with. Our approach of my intelligent adaptive interventions lab, so two staff grad students, three in experimental computational psychology, and six in computer science. And this is a pretty broad problem across many fields. So let's dive in now. So when I use an adaptive experiment, how do we think about adaptive randomization probability? So if you're testing explanation ABC in a website, for example, to optimize for the reward or the outcome of more clicks, a traditional uniform random 50-50 experiment would randomize 50-50 to an arm more condition, A versus B, analyze the data, and then decide when to stop. So you go from 50-50 to 0-100. In an adaptive experiment, we change the probability of assignments adaptively using the data being collected. So we have to trade off potential practical benefits. What we call reward is the outcome for people with scientific benefits. Can we draw inferences about which explanations might actually be better or not with some confidence? And here's the algorithm we focus on. The multi-arm banded algorithm called posterior or Thompson sampling. And the idea here is you assign an explanation A versus B based on the changing posterior probability of this explanation giving the highest click rate on papers. Does that make sense? So you would start off with that kind of explanation. You might be 50-50, 70-30, 90-10, and you keep modifying and potentially adding as you go along. So I think you have a sense of what an adaptive, adaptive randomized experiment is. So to be more specific or formal, when we talk about posterior Thompson sampling, let's just take the most fundamental case, because that's not even nailed down yet. The multi band algorithm, which is a subset of reinforcement learning, you can think of as randomized posterior matching, Thompson sampling. So think of a beta Bruni Bayesian model. You've got two arms, explanation A or B, and a binary reward outcome like clicking on papers. So you have a set of actions, for example, explanation ABC. You have a reward or outcome, 0, 1, they clicked on a paper to learn more. And have your policy or your policy learning algorithm. This might be the 35%, 65%. And it's the assignment probability over time. How is it being learned? Well, in this case, think of actually a simple beta distribution, where the beta distribution is on the probability of this explanation leading to a click. And then you have a Bernoulli likelihood where the reward, whether you click or not, is Bernoulli with the probability of success that comes from the beta. Does that make sense, the basic setup? So here the overview of the talk, and I'm just gonna tell you right now the key results and the goals. The first part is empirical. How do you articulate these statistical challenges in analyzing adaptive experiments? And I'll tell you right now, the false positive rate when you do a test is increased and you get reduced power when you do an adaptive experiment with Tom's sampling in this two-arm case. And when there's even no arm differences, because of random lows, you get bias estimates of one means and a higher chance of a false positive or type one error. And this is interesting, it shows up actually even in Bayesian analysis, where the assignment or posterior probability favors one arm even when there's no difference. So this points towards the kind of what we call algorithm-attuned analyses and tests. How do we come up with statistical analysis and tests that are tuned to how the algorithm is adapting the experiment? And I'll give you one example of this um, for Thompson sampling that's broadly applicable, an algorithm in the use test statistic that basically works by generating the distribution of the test statistic under the null using a particular algorithm and parameters and allows you to set the critical values to the test. So this lets you control false positive rate. It's a good step forward, but it can heavily reduce power. And because it reduces power, it points to why we need more statistically sensitive algorithms. So ML algorithms are trade off not just reward, giving what's best, best conditions or arms, but actually with collecting data that minimizes FPR and maximizes power. And what I'll present here is hybrid combinations of reward maximizing band algorithms like Thompson sampling, TS, with traditional uniform random experiments. And in particular, the algorithm we see to be most helpful is what we call Thompson sampling posterior difference. And the key idea here is 
let's adapt the amount of uniform random expression to be proportional to the probability that arm differences are small. So when the small arm differences do more uniform random expression, when they're bigger, do less. And we'll show how this, on average, better balance the reward with power and force positive rate. Does that make sense to everyone? You could leave the talk right now. <laughs> okay, so first part in terms of empirical exploration. You can read up on the paper there. So the result I want to emphasize is if you're comparing Armistan policies like uniform random and Thompson sampling, we look at the false positive rate or type 1 error, the probability of falsely detecting a significant result when there's no effect, and then the power, right? 1 minus false negative rate. What's the probability of correctly detecting the effect when it's present? And we'll consider two relevant environments. The arm difference, so effect size is 0. For example, the proportion of success, people clicking on your website, is both 0.5. Arm difference of 0.1. For example, the proportion of success for website version A is 0.45, 0.55 for version 2. And even looking at this fundamental wall z-test statistic to compare the means. The key result here is that the false positive rate on sampling can go up to 13.4% compared to 5% for uniform random, and power can drop to 56% compared to 81. And we've just shown that across a range of other tests, even Bayesian analyses, this is also an issue. So why is this happening? Well, here's one contribution. Think of this illustrative example where there's no true online difference. So the vertical axis is the sample estimates of means. Blue is P1, orange is P2. And the green is actually the posterior probability, according to Thompson sampling, the assignment probability. And what you can see is when you have random loads, such as P2 having a lower sample estimate, what happens? Well, you stop assigning to it. So you actually assign increasing number of participants to one arm. So you might get an accurate estimate of it and a tight standard error there. But you still never actually unlearn that you have a biased estimate. So you can actually get strong evidence for a difference because they adapted data sampling. And in particular, that might happen 30% of the time compared to 5% for uniform random. Does that give an intuition for why this kind of effect occurs? In terms of why you get lower power with a false negative, this one is a bit clearer. Even if an R mean is better, because you assign more people to one arm, um, you don't actually get strong evidence for that. So you just don't know. Am I in the world where this is a false positive? Or is there actual difference, or is it a false negative? Does that give a bit of a sense to people on why this is occurring? And what I would emphasize is that if you look at the posterior probability, Thompson sampling is not actually doing posterior sampling. You've got biased estimates of the posterior probability that one arm is better than another. Even when there's no difference, it tends to favor one arm quite strongly. So what are your key takeaways from that in terms of what statistics and ML has to do to support these adaptive experiments that can improve technology? Well, one challenge here is we're getting increased false positive rate, 5 to 13, and reduced power. Even when there's no arm differences, random loads cause bias estimates. So let's move on to the second part, algorithm-tuned analyses and tests. So the key idea here is how do you modify statistical tests using properties of the algorithm? And the problem here you can think of is Tom Stanton is changing the distribution of the wall test statistic relative to uniform random traditional experiments. So a potential solution is how do we adjust the hypothesis tests to account for the adaptive nature of data collection? And there are a range of techniques we've used, but I'm just going to focus on the first one today, this algorithm-induced test statistic. So here's the wall test statistic distribution on uniform random for the arm difference of zero in the blue and then in the red or orange, the arm difference of 0.1. Now, when you use Thompson sampling, what you see is that you've actually got this skewing because of those effects I mentioned earlier, where you've got those random lows that make it look like there's a difference when one doesn't exist. You can actually get pretty extreme values the test stick under the null. And then even on the alternative, when there is actually a difference, the evidence is less strong. So then an idea here is that if you've got this distribution of the this algorithm and use test statistic here, right, under the null. You can then actually adjust the critical values. Instead of being, for example, 1.96, like they would be for uniform random, to get your FPR of 5%, you want to adjust this. So you don't have 30%, but 5%. Make sense to people? You're just adjusting the critical value to control your false positive rate. 
And so now that's nice, right? You're under the critical value of 2.6, which I'm sampling, under the argument use test, which is 1.96, and you get your false positive 5%. And this is nice because you apply it to any algorithm. However, the wall test actually has 17% power when you adjust in this way. So that points to actually now. Now, the other approaches you can use, which I won't go into much depth on, but Fred Houch and Song, my stats patient student in second year, is working on this. It works pretty well for small sample sizes, and it basically constructs a new test statistic that uses the number of times the Tom Snappy Archon probabilities are greater than 0.5. But what are the key takeaways from this? Well, this is a nice approach for enabling false positive rate control, right? You can actually control it to what you'd be expecting, but power can be very low. So it suggests we simultaneously need more statistically sensitive algorithms. We just have to collect better data to be able to draw these inferences. So that's part three now. I'll give you a second to read that. So this is Tong Lee, a third year stats PhD student, and this is the paper. So these multi band algorithms like Tom Snapping, they optimize for a water outcome, giving arms with higher means during the experiment. How do you make more statistically sensitive algorithms? Change data collection for better FBR and power, as well as Bayesian analyses. So we investigate hybrid combinations of alternately assigning arms to participants using uniform random, 50-50 traditional experiment, and Thompson sampling, where you're doing this banded reward maximization. And there are a couple algorithms we compare, and some have been used in practice, but we're going to focus on Thompson sampling posterior difference. You could also call it statistically sensitive Thompson sampling, or any better names are welcome. <laughs> so the key idea here is we have a data adapted proportion, phi of t, of arms assigned with uniform random. Adapt phi of t is the posterior probability, the arm difference is small, below some threshold parameter c. And so this is nice because if someone's running an experiment, they can actually define it. They can say, well, I think 0.1 difference in arm means it's small. Below 0.1, I don't mind if you do a uniform random and I lose out on reward or helping people, because I want to know if there's a difference or not. Someone else, a 0.3 arm difference might be small. And so less people kind of set, whether you're an instructor, a website designer, what you consider small enough that you're willing to forego reward or good outcomes in favor of inference. And so the key idea here is that when there's zero or small effects, you do more uniform random, less norm sampling. You can get a better false positive rate without really losing any reward, and a better power, with minimal loss in reward. Now, when the large effects do less uniform round and more Tom sampling, so you lose power, but you gain reward. And more specifically, Tom sampling plus your probability difference is with probability phi of t, you choose arms using uniform random. With probability 1 minus phi of t, you choose them with Tom sampling. And phi of t is the posterior probability at observation participant t that the difference in the expected mean outcomes is small less than the threshold C that you set, an experimental sets, or a practitioner. And again, the target here is hypothesis you get more uniform random when the probability of zero small effects is high, more Tom something when the probability of large effects is high. This is the algorithm here. So this is a graph that I will just put up here and can explore later. But we match the false positive rate of type 1 error, 6, 7, 8%, by choosing parameters for the different algorithms. And then you can actually now compare the trade-off arm differences from 0.2 to 0.3 to 0.5. Higher power here, higher reward. And this helps you understand in what settings something may perform better. But on average, Tom Stanley plus your difference is a better balance for reward and power. On average, it might be across many different arm differences, many different sample sizes, 0.919 versus and 0.6 reward. And so why is it doing this? What is helpful about it? It's because it adapts a portion of participants, this is a bit simply stated, who are assigned to the optimal or seemingly superior arm. Optimal if there's actually difference, seemingly superior if you're not sure. So think about an arm difference or effect size of 0.3. TS positive now is actually assigning 96% of people to one arm, which is good, you're getting reward. Compared to, for example, its closest competitor, uh, a fixed epsilon top sampling, where you just say, assign 12% of the time, give everyone uniform random, it doesn't adapt. So 0.96 is 0.92, a uh, proportion of people assigned the optimal arm. On the other hand, with the arm difference of 0.1, now you see 0.74 is 0.823. It's now actually balancing it more across conditions. And finally, when there's no difference at all, you actually see a much more closer to 
50-50 assignment. So what's beneficial here is by a definite portion of people being assigned, it can actually give you a better trade-off of reward, power, and false positive rates by doing more uniform random when there's no reward to be gained or minimal, and more reward maximization when you do want to actually give people the better arm, because there's a big effect. Does that make sense? So what are the key takeaways here? The idea is that Tom Sampling, post-diff, is better training off reward power and FPR by incorporating traditional experiments when arm differences of X size are small. And this is more recent work, we're actually crunching this now, but the combination of Tom Sampling plus two difference and the algorithm induced test seems particularly effective. So when you can fix your false positive 5%, uniform random might be 87% power, Tom Sampling is 46%, the close compared is 66, and then Tom Sampling plus two difference is 82%. So this is quite promising because We've got to trade off reward and power and false positive in some way. For example, if you want to get people to click on your website and you also want to learn what's actually working. Um, but here's, it's very, what do we tell practitioners to do? A social behavioral scientist, a political scientist to do? I think this is very promising what could actually be used in practice. The algorithm induced test, plus also a more statistically sensitive algorithm. Great, so just to review the, key, the goals and the key results, I saw in this vision, how do we, perpetually enhance technology around us. And the idea here is we can turn any piece of technology from a website to a text message into an intelligent adaptive intervention by actually having perpetually adaptive experimentation, constantly adding in ideas and testing them out. But what do we need for that? We need to actually have algorithms and analyses for these adaptive experiments. So I started by empirically exploring and characterizing these statistical challenges in analyzing adaptive experiments and showed that even the most fundamental case of two arms you get an increased false positive rate and reduced power from 5% to 13% false positive rate. Even when there's no arm differences, one drive of this effect is random lows caused bias estimates of one arm mean. And we showed across a range of statistical tests and also even Bayesian analyses that this posterior probably favors one arm. It converges on one even when there's no difference. So to solve that, we take a two-pronged approach. We think of algorithm-attuned analyses and tests that are actually attuned to how the algorithm adapts the experiment. And so I mentioned the algorithm-induced test statistic that basically generates under the null the distribution of the test statistic for a particular algorithm and its parameters, which allows you to adjust your critical values to control false positive rate. However, that does reduce power, as you remember from the distribution. And so that points to the need for actually more statistically sensitive algorithms that are actually collecting data that will be useful for analysis. And the idea here is Algorithms that trade off reward, given the best conditions arm to participants, with collecting data that minimizes FPR and maximizes power. And so we look at hybrid combinations of reward maximizing with traditional uniform random experiments, and the Tom sampling posterior difference algorithm, or statistically sensitive Tom sampling, gives an adaptive amount of uniform random exploration, which is the proportion of times you assign to uniform random is proportionally probably and arm difference is small, where you actually define that parameter as an experimenter in terms of what you're willing to forego um, when you're willing to give up reward for getting good, better inference. And we have evidence that that's a better balance for reward power and false positive rates. And so I'm optimistic that actually we can combine these two, algorithm-induced test statistic with, algorithm, with algorithms like this to actually give practitioners something they can use. And just in terms of ongoing research, one thing to think about is, could we actually get more post accurate posteriors? So Thompson sampling claims that it gives you posterior sampling, but we've seen that's not actually the case. If we could actually give practitioners more accurate posteriors while experiments are running, instead of just a hypothesis test, then they could choose. If the actual probability of A is better than B is 60-40, then someone could choose to assign 80-20 to maximize reward, or they could assign 55-45. So I think that'd be a really interesting direction to pursue. Great, thanks so much.